All right, it's 1803. Let us go through and then we can start. All right, we got, all right, all right, it's 1803. Let us go through and then we can start. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Avery Research Center for African American History and Cultures Night of Exciting Things. But really, it's an opportunity for us to highlight our documenting the ARC project. My name is Dr. Tamara Butler, and I'm the executive director at the Avery Research Center. I'm also co principal investigator on this dynamic. Um, grant from the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation on broadening narratives. So tonight, I'm not, you didn't come here usually to hear much from me. It's actually an opportunity for hear from our research team, as well as our community advisory board. And so just kind of what I would like to do here is just think about as you're listening in, um, how you may want to contribute to this project and help us grow this project. Um, also thinking about how it expands the mission and work that we do here at the Avery Research Center. Our mission is to collect, promote, and preserve um, the histories and stories of African of the African diaspora. Um, really big emphasis on preserve as well as promote. And so through this uh, particular grant, it gives us the opportunity to do those two things in particular as well as collect. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ms. Aisha Heichel, who is the Manager of Archival Services here at the A Research Center, as well as librarian, um, as well as co-principal investigator, a woman of many hats. Turn it over to you, Aisha. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler, and everyone for participating in tonight's program. And I will be introducing the project as a whole, as well as talking about um, the project that can be in the ARC, the Low Country Civil Rights and the Era of Black Lives Matter, which is the title of our project. So the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation is a foundation that provides funding to, um, to artists and to collecting institutions such as Avery to do projects. And one, and they're focusing on the South, South Carolina Low Country and the Chicago region. Those are their two areas of interest. And um, last year, well, last year, in 2020, fall 2020, they announced a new project called Broadening Narratives Initiative. And they really aim to understand and broaden um, the different types of records and about people and communities who are within different collecting agencies. And so they wanna say, uh, focus on collections of Afri African-American, Native Americans, um, LGBTQIA communities, or of other underrepresented people in, in most archives. Um, and so Avery as a collective institution is, was eligible to apply for this funding. And so we talked to, about it with in our staff about what would be the most um, needed collecting spaces for Avery. And we saw that there was a gap in our collection relating to activism in the 21st century, um, and especially looking at the, the 2000s um, activism. And we saw, okay, there was a pivotal point in Charles and history that we didn't have much many records on. And that was what we chose to focus this project on. Um, they are, they meaning Gaylord and Dr. Donnelly Foundation are continuing to accept applications. And so you can find out more about their policies on the website, which is listed here. Noted, we were one of other institutions in the region that were receive funding, and so you find out more about those initiatives on the website as well. So uh, Dr. Butler mentioned our focus on, on preserving a history of African American low country. And so we saw this project as an extension of those collecting areas and of the collections we already have at Avery. So we already collect the histories of individuals that have been involved with the civil rights movement in the past, including um, 
Cleveland Sellers and his work um, through his activism in Orangeburg up through his efforts in political offices. And so we want to continue legacy with this project to show that Charleston not only has a history of activism, but continues to this trajectory. And we also already collect the history of movements. So we have a great um, collection relating to civil rights movement, women's history movement, and uh, activism uh, collection relating to the Black Museum movement and the Black Hospital movement. So I think this, this project really continued legacy of documenting movements and the the idea to collect Black, Black, Black Lives Matter uh, also was important to us because uh, there were a lot of different narratives in the media that talked about different people or different organizations, but then we really have the full history of the story. And so we wanted to use these narratives or histories that we're collecting to have the possibility for the activists themselves people that were involved in the movement to have the opportunity to tell their own story in their own words so that we can actually have a representation of those histories uh, for later scholarship and for education purposes. So that was kind of the real impetus for um, Avery's proposal to the foundation. So the project has about three different elements to it. One is uh, the video or histories and the community portal, and then a community advisory board. Uh, I mentioned earlier, this is kind of the, the time span we're looking at. It's from 2014 to 2020, um, really the periods of, of unrest, but then also um, community um, coming together to write around different issues facing the Black community and the Charleston community as a whole. And so these are kind of touch points that we saw as ways to get into this conversation of activism um, in Charleston. And so we have, um, we've been conducting these interviews throughout. We began collecting, conducting them um, in the fall and we will be continuing to do that um, in the spring semester. And uh, part of the proposal we talked about was participatory archives, which is um, uh, a new uh, phase of archives that we are seeing uh, in the profession. We're seeing the having the people who create the records be actively uh, engaged in the preservation of them and then also the description of those records. So that's kind of a participatory archive um, that we wanted to bring into the conversation. And so that is why we have the Community Advisory Board, which is made up of uh, people, individuals who were participated in different organizations in Charleston uh, during this time period. And so they are advising us on particular interview questions, on creating a timeline for the, for the events. They're helping to identify interviewees and we'll be review, helping us to review the submissions of the community portal. So this community advisory board is very vital to the work of this project and we're so glad and support and glad that they agreed to participate in this project and we are indebted to their participation. Uh, we also make sure that we are following guidelines by the Oral History Association that's set out. So we um, take our, our um, documentation, everything follows policies and procedures that are set out in that way. And we also have some ethical consideration for these, as we realized talking to the advisory board that there were concerns about asking um, people who already do so much <laughs> to ask them to do more, right? And so we were really concerned about and took considerations in terms of uh, what kind of questions we're asking and kind of legal issues that they may be facing. Um, we had a conversation about being anonymous or being, or being identified. And so those are kind of things that wanna, anyone who is taking on any kind of, um, or history that may contain sensitive information that these are things you need to be aware of. And so these are a couple of resources that document in the now Texas, Texas After Violence and Witness are a few resources that you should consider when you are doing um, work around people who are active and maybe actually targets, uh, potential targets for you know, hate crimes or other uh, terroristic um, activity. 
And there we realized as we were doing the proposal that there were models out there that we could consider and look to for guidance. And so a few of them are Archives of Black Lives in Philadelphia, Document Black Lives Matter out of um, the UK. And then here locally, during the pandemic, the uh, South Carolina, South Carolina African American Heritage Commission um, operated or coordinated a project called Black Carolina Speak, Portraits of a Pandemic. And that was a, a project where they asked people to submit portraits or information regarding responses or reflections to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so that was, uh, you know, kind of another model in terms of getting submissions and um, doing outreach to the community to gather information. So uh, the project outcomes, we are aiming to conduct, record, transcribe, and 20 plus video or histories. Um, we are in the process of doing that. We do the, we do the interviews at Avery and under the care and guidance of Ms. Melissa Brown or Dr. Melissa Brown, who you'll be hearing from in a moment. Um, we are interviewing millennials, Generation Z, and veteran activists uh, from different varieties of disciplines and roles in the movement. So we are um, really aiming to do that. Um, then we are we are releasing tonight, the first time to the public, the online submission portal. And I'll be talking about the process for that and how you can be involved. Because we realize that the 20 plus people are not representative of the project as a whole, different roles and activisms. And so we want to get people who can't interview, people who might have left Charleston and now want are living elsewhere, they can still participate and donate to the collection by the portal. And information about that will be given in a moment. We will be providing access to the oral histories via uh, the Low Country Digital Library, also known as LCDL. And uh, the College of Charleston will is has invested in a new platform called Aviary, and that will be the way um, to see the videos and transcripts. And we are planning and we are hosting right now a, a Avery Digital Classroom event. We'll probably have one more uh, later this spring when we complete the project. So you can have, um, see all the different uh, videos that we did and, ask, and give us any questions or feedback um, from that. So I mentioned earlier, um, provide access to the materials with through Aviary. This is an example. I'm not from the College of Charleston, I'm from Avery, but from Aviary, <laughs> which you know is I think is a like interesting um, tongue in cheek with Avery. Um, but Aviary, it's a it's a platform that the College of Charleston has subscribed to, um, and will be um, using to provide access to our oral histories and video um, content um, for the project. And so this is an example from Hamilton College um, archives. So um, yeah, if you go to the website, if you go to Aviary website, you can basically click on the play button and the video and the transcript will play at the same time. So it's really an upgrade to the current way that um, we view and access um, oral histories. So I mentioned earlier about the advisory board members, and these are the members um, listed here. Um, and so we have uh, Ms. Cora Webb, uh, Jesse Parks, Leticia Bradley, uh, Brandon Fish, Nigia Richardson, Akua, Akua Page. Um, and then the people in red are the people that you will be hearing from later this, this afternoon, oh, sorry, evening. <laughs> um, we have um, Avery staff um, here tonight, uh, myself, Ms. Erica Vio, um, Dr. Dr. Butler, and um, Darren. And then we also be able to hire um, a project team as well. And so um, Kay Hogan, project manager, um, JJ, he's a, a grad student um, here at the college. And I'm Josh Parks and Dr. Melissa Brown as our or historian. And I will turn it over to Ms. Erica to talk about um, the current status. Greetings, everyone. All right, so 
Thank you for joining us tonight. And so far, we have got quite a lot accomplished with this um, grant project, Documenting the Arc. So far, we have conducted 12 interviews with nine individuals, um, many of which are a part of the Community Advisory Board. And just so you know, the Community Advisory Board members are myself, Darren Lee Calhoun II, Brandon Fish, Akua Page, Jesse Parks, uh, Imara Mutawaf, and I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, Cora Webb and Nigeria Richardson. So we've conducted uh, interviews with a number of those individuals and some additional members of the community as well, like Thomas Dixon, KJ Kearney, Jason Gordine, and we have about another 10 to 12 interviews that are lined up that we are in the process of scheduling in the month of February. So we're really excited about what we've accomplished so far. The interviews that we have, the video interviews that we've recorded, we have uploaded them to the Low Country Digital Library. So we're in the process of transcribing the audio from those interviews and making them available um, for researchers in the future. So we've been sending out lots of invitations to people that we know were actively involved in the calls for justice over the last several years in Charleston and every day we are locking folks in and we're trying to conduct uh, interviews with folks who are local. A lot of folks have left Char the Charleston area. So as of right now, we're trying to take care of the local folks and then we'll start doing, because what basically what we're doing is we are interviewing folks at Avery. We've kind of set up a really cool studio on the first floor in Avery and every Monday and Friday, we conduct interviews when we have them scheduled. So. Once we get those out of the way, we'll start doing remote interviews with folks who have left the Charleston area and continue to upload those to the Low Country Digital Library and transcribe the, the um, audio from every interview. And we've got a list of about 40 people that we have identified, the Community Advisory Board, and we're probably only gonna be able to do about 35 uh, individual interviews with folks. So we've got an additional list of about another 40 or so people that we know we would like to contribute to our community submissions portal. So if you know anyone who you think is worthy of an interview, feel free to send them our way. And don't feel bad if you don't make it to, we, we can't, we recognize that we can't interview everyone, but the community submission portal is going to be a great way to get stories and poetry and music and protest signs and images and, and just different um, ex people's experiences with the um, um, local movement in the last several years. So we've worked really hard with Cedar Wolf Media to create that um, community submission portal, which is available on our website under the outreach tab. So check that out, uh, submit an interest form if you are interested and share the link if you know anyone who is interested in submitting or has stuff that you think would be uh, great to donate to our collection, our documenting the art collection. I'm super excited about this project thus far. And um, I'm going to turn it over to some of our advisory board members and videographer who have, um, part have done in who have done video interviews so they can talk a little bit about their experience and what they have learned thus far. So let's, Josh, do you wanna start? Where are we at? Or we can start with Dr. Brown. Let's we'll start with Dr. Brown for now. Okay. Um, I think Josh is saying that he can't unmute himself, so he may need some help. Um, in the meantime, I'm delighted to be with everybody tonight. I think there are three particular perspectives I want to share. I think the first one being how really very proud I am to be a part of this project. 
Um, I am for sure probably the most senior member of the team. And that means a lot to me to have the um, opportunity to hear from and work with uh, young people who have in so many different ways found themselves committed to um, activism of variants, various sorts and values and goals, um, many of which um, I and my generation were committed to as well. So it's quite an honor for sure. I'd also like to say that um, I'm part of a number of networks of oral historians around the country that are realizing how difficult it is to go back many, many years later and recapture some of these experiences and perspectives. Um, it is so exciting that we realize with the technology that we have available to us that we must collect stories and various other um, mediums of experiences while they are fresh in our minds and while people are available to offer them. And believe me, those of us from earlier decades are really scrambling to find people and um, find documentation and make sure that we have accurate records. And so this project I think is particularly exciting because of its timeliness. I'd like to probably then end by saying that having taught and worked with researchers for many years, this project is also exciting because we are already anticipating people in the future wanting access to this information. It is going to be very difficult years in the future to assure that there are accurate depictions and descriptions and interpretations of what was going on, what were people thinking, what were their goals. Um, if we leave it up to local newspaper accounts, we will find that many things will be misinterpreted. And so this type of project documenting um, the ARC is a way to say, we will allow people who were involved in various and sundry ways to tell their stories in their own way. And that is a very, very important part of collecting history. So thank you for having me involved. And now I'll, push it over to Josh if he's been able to get in. I'm in now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brown. But um, no, I just second everything uh, Dr. Brown said, you know, this opportunity uh, with the Avery Research Center with Dr. Brown, um, with all the participants. I think the way that Avery is doing this is just in, in such a democratic way. Um, the people who were part of the movement who are also involved in the process of, you know, of creating, you know, this arc or documenting this arc. And I think, you know, we're doing it the right way and, and the interviews have been amazing so far. Um, like Dr. Brown alluded to, you know, people are able to tell their own stories. And I love the way that, you know, it's not merely about, you know, um, what was happening in 2015 and then in the movement and during that time, but it's also about, you know, just the people who were involved and, and Dr. Brown is just doing such a great job of like, diving in with the interviews to get to understand the people to know why they even chose to um, join the movement, you know? So I just think we're doing an excellent job in that fashion. And I have a, just a short, about two minute and 30 second um, video I wanna play with just some snippets of some interviews and some moments that I thought were, were really important. So if you allow me, um, can everyone see my screen still in, in here? Let me know if you can hear what's, what's um, playing through my video. Okay. Uh, this was the summer. Can you yes. see it? Yes. yes. Okay. We can see. We can hear it. 
Okay. Uh, that uh, a lot of people is calling the summer of death of black people that we just start seeing over and over again. Young black men were being killed by police over and over again. And when Mike Brown hit, it just blew up. And we saw Ferguson blow up. We saw Baltimore blow up. We saw uh, plenty of places to start to just really uh, have these major demonstrations about the meaning of black lives and you know, the, the beginning of black lives matter happening. So um, after I read a Sada Shakur book, it it really opened my eyes to the issues that still exist, um, not even just within Charleston, but globally. It, it really, I feel like that was when my awakening happened. It like raised my consciousness to a different level. And I wanted to like be in more spaces like that to see how can we really make things really equitable and fair for everybody. Because like when I looked around, I looked at that and I really like analyzed what was going on. Like what are really the root causes of all? Like, you know, we talk about food insecurity, we talk about poverty, we talk about the criminal justice system, you know, but what is really the root cause of that? So now if you have a history, but you're accused of something. So I've been notified that y'all can't see. Can y'all not see still? Can y'all see the video? No, we just, I just see you. Oh, God. The audio's. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. What about now? Yeah. Can we see? Okay. I mean, this was the summer that uh, a lot of people was calling the summer of death of Black people that we just start seeing over and over again. Young Black men were being killed by police over and over again. And when Mike Brown hit, it just blew up. And we saw Ferguson blow up. We saw Baltimore blow up. We saw uh, plenty of places start to just really uh, have these major demonstrations about the meaning of Black lives and you know, the, the beginning of Black lives matter happening during that time. So um, after I read the Sada Shakur book, it it really opened my eyes to the issues that still exist, um, not even just within Charleston, but globally. It, it really, I feel like that was when my awakening happened. It like raised my consciousness to a different level. And I wanted to like be in more spaces like that to see how can we really make things really equitable and fair for everybody. Because like when I looked around, I looked at that and I really like analyzed what was going on. Like what are really the root causes of all? Like, you know, we talk about food insecurity, we talk about poverty, we talk about the criminal justice system, you know, but what is really the root cause of that? So now if you have a history, but you're accused of something and you go to jail, even if you didn't do that thing, you can still get a five and six digit bail just based upon your previous history because they count it. It's like scored. And they try to say that it's objective and fair. I've met with those folks that um, that now do that. They said it's objective and fair, but I don't think anything, um, the police can't police themselves. So of course a police is gonna decide that that measure that they're using is fair because they're police, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the new generation, they're begging for participation. They've been begging for a year and a half um, uh, for participation from the, what the, they call the elders. One of the most common questions that I get from them, where are the rest at? Where are the other elders? We got you. We know that if we got something going on, you will be there. Where are the rest of them? If you're here 20 years from now and you have this longing to do something in the social justice vein, you're there for that purpose right now. And everything has come together. Whatever technology exists right now, everything that, that you're good at, that you, that you have your hand to, you're supposed to be doing that. So those are just some um, some highlights, some moments that I thought were were really good and just encapsulated again Dr. Brown's um, expertise and just interviewing people and getting them you know getting to the root cause of things and and really getting a story out of people and and, and I just you know I just want to share that really quick with y'all. So um, so I don't know if y'all were able to see it that time, but um, I will send a link out because I think we're having issues sharing the, the actual video. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. So 
Cora, would you like to share next? Um, sure. I also want to acknowledge that I keep seeing Darren unmute. And so, Darren, I would love to give you the opportunity to go ahead and share before I go. <laughs> By all means, Cora, you got it. I love you. Suzuki. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, um, hello everyone. My name's Cora, use any pronouns, and I work at We Are Family. And I would like to start by saying that like, throughout surviving this pandemic, many of us have felt very disconnected and very stagnant. So the timing of this project has definitely opened up the opportunity to confront the resistance and survival of our community through a lens of surviving at the cross section of many pandemics that people have mentioned already with the interviews and in, in the snippet that Joshua has had. So state and police violence, forced poverty, and many, many more. And so for people like me who are around and involved in many different things, and so we're connected, uh, but we trick ourselves into thinking we don't do enough to be involved in captured narrative projects like this, uh, the project gives us a chance to reground ourselves in the values and the journey and the histories that have led us here. And they affirm that all of our narratives and involvement matters. Um, and I also like to just repeat that, like all of our narratives and our involvement matters. And that's regardless of you were invited to even participate in this project. Um, there are many people that are whose names may not be mentioned, but we want you to come forward and share that, you know, your expertise and your experiences and your tactics for survival through these moments and the moments before that you lived through. Um, and although um, this is very tender material, as we understand, I had that as like a, as like a statement I um, included when I reached out to certain people, Reaching back out to my community members that I've grown to admire over the years reignites my desire to change myself internally and externally around me. Um, and so that lets me know that they've never actually left my life. You know, a lot of the time, especially through this pandemic, we've been kind of scattered. We have a lot of different things we have to uphold. We've been in Zoom world like we are now. And so it, it lets me know that I've, these people are forever with me through, through storytelling and through capturing their narratives like this. Uh, and through these type of projects, we're forever connected. Um, and also it's taught me that storytelling is very vital to our survival. Um, it's vital to me feeling grounded. It's vital to me feeling like I've, I'm doing okay. I like laughing as well and just sharing. I like when people remember times that um, I've impacted their lives that I may have forgotten, you know, those little small moments. But I um, have appreciated just seeing the insight other people in this project have offered um, and the opportunity to unlock certain memories for other people that um, sometimes have been discarded. So I've really appreciated that. And I'd like to also pass it back to Darren. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I love you. And, um, I just want to speak to um, first as a member of the staff of the Avery Research Center for African American Institute and Culture, um, I am very grateful for the opportunity that we have through this grant to put out these narratives that we have. Um, it is very important that the narrative is captured now as opposed to 20, 30 years from now. Um, so, I want to thank the Donna Lee Foundation as well as everybody else who put in to actually get this through. Now, speaking as somebody who is not as part of the Avery, as not as part of the College of Charleston, who's not as part of the school district and all these other different things that I do, as Darren Calhoun, who is who was one of the folk who was part of Black Lives Matter and Charles, Black Lives Matter Charleston in 2015. When Erica first brought this to me, prior to us getting this grant, I said, I do not want to talk about it. it that, 2015 was traumatizing for a lot of us. Um, I left Charleston in 2015 because of this. Um, so when we got the grant and I, you know, being one of the people was like, all right, I'm ready to, I may not have been ready to talk about it, but I'm willing to talk about it. 
and then actually sitting down with uh, Dr. Brown with Millicent and talking about the things that happened in 2014, 15. It was, um, it was hard, but we, we got through it. And I know there are still some folk out there who were a part of it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call out Jamie and I'm gonna call out Claire and everybody else. There are some folk who have some narratives that need to be put on record and I'm ready for everybody to get put on, to, to be put on a record for 2000, for Black Lives Matter in Charleston. Um, it was it was hard for a lot of us and we need to get everybody on record to talk about what happened now while it's still fresh. Um, we really see what happened with the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s and how it took so many years and so many archival um, di uh, digs to find out what truly happened back then. We don't want that to happen again. We need everybody to come forward and actually put their 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 story on the record now. So, please, if you are if you were part of the movement that we had back in 2014, 15, and 16, 17, hop in. Let's let's get it down and let's have that conversation. And if we have folk who are very uh, who are hesitant to get on, let's have have those conversations on record and then let's talk about them afterwards. But please get your get your story down. Um, like I said, I'm speaking as uh, speaking on this as a person from uh, who's not part of the institution, but as part of somebody who's on the ground, who is working and doing those things. Um, it's been a long road, and I feel as if I'm an elder now, being from 2015, and we're only seven years away, and that's why. Um, but yes, please hop down and let's get let's let's all get back together and talk about this because I mean, we see what happened yesterday at city council. Um, the stuff we were fighting for seven years ago still happening right now. Everything that we are fighting for is still happening right now. So no matter what role we are in right now, we we have to still keep fighting. The uh, we who believe in freedom will not rest, and so we just gonna keep fighting right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to Erica. Thank you. Peace. Letitia, did you go? Amara? Hey. <laughs> I have enjoyed everybody's comments and statements so very much. Um, no, I haven't went and thank you, Erica, and everyone else for giving me this opportunity to speak about something that, like Darren said, I didn't necessarily have the capacity to um, in the past. Um, by the time I got to Black Lives Matter, it was like me and maybe three other people on a regular basis. And it was a lot of work and it was a lot of everything else, but what it was really supposed to be at times, but we were there. And I've used that to guide my decision-making and guide my activism into things that are useful now. Um, and that's where probably my story, I spent a lot of it on in the um the documentaries just explaining that story how do we make this work resonate and stay here and not stay in the pain of some of the the running about it felt like um has happened but yeah so I, I really felt that part of it because there are a few of us that are not here to share those particular stories and their their narratives are definitely pivotal and so important to the whole story. But the loss was just as painful and it was just so unexpected as opposed to what I thought activism was supposed to be. You know, I thought we were past that. But obviously we aren't, like Darren said, um, at the city council meeting as what was shown. And we we've got to move forward um, and try to free, you know, those who are captive from doing this work, as well as, you know, heal from losing others um, that we have lost in doing this work. So it's a very important project. I am very happy to be a part of it. Um, every day, I do not have the capacity for it. And yes, Shango, I said um, about 10 times, I know you're listening. But we are here now, um, and thank you for the opportunity to let me be on this project.
Thank you, Leticia and Mara. If there are any questions, please drop them in the chat. And if anyone is monitoring the Facebook Live and the YouTube channel, if there are any questions from those streams, please uh, drop them in the chat here. Um, thank you. Thank you all, community advisor, board members, and uh, consultants. Your, your reflections are just so inspiring. Um, and heartfelt and really encourages us and empower us to do more um, and to get this project out there to the public. Um, you all in some way or another talked about getting your story out there. And so that is why I want to talk about the community portal. <laughs> so um, if you do not want to be interviewed, but you have been collecting um, you know, photographs or um, and flyers, brochures, posters from different um, rallies. Um, we are interested in collecting that aspect as well to support um, the narrative, the video or histories we've been, we are collecting. And so we have created um, through Cedar Grove Media's assistance and support uh, this community portal. Um, and so we are, it's open to the public. So we have two phases to the portal. Um, one is an interest form that we are encouraging folks to fill out and that talks about um, what you're interested in donating, um, the types of, if it's paper, if it's print, if it's, um, images, if it's digital materials, that will help us um, review it and then get back to you regarding the process to have us actually receive the materials at Avery. Um, and if they want to hear, we, if you are a creative person, um, if you have a short story or poetry, or you have a song, um, thing with the tribute as well that is also of interest to our so rather they document the whole life experience of an activist during this time and so that is what we're interested in on um, the website is open the link is here it's also in the chat and um and now we're open for q a thank you so much Hey, Aisha, I didn't see any Q&A inside of the YouTube or Facebook. However, um, if you just go ahead and give the information to where folk can um, reach out to us uh, outside of this uh, event and as they reach out uh, as they watch this event, they can uh, find us and we can get back to them that way. Oh, yes. So we are available on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, the project information is on, a, is on our website, um, avery.cfc.edu, under the Outreach tab. And then you're going to go to Archival Projects under um, Documenting the, the ARC. <laughs> so it's Outreach, Archival Projects, Documenting the ARC portal um, is also available on our, on the homepage, you go to Archival Projects and that can also enter you into the portal. Um, so that is kind of how we, or you always just email us too, um, through the contact us form to gain access. So we are always open for questions and able to talk with you as well. If you're unsure if what you're interested in donating is appropriate, feel free to email us or call us and we'll be glad to talk to you before you do the interest form as well. Um, and if you are uh, want to be interviewed on video, please feel free to contact us and we'll see if we can schedule you um, along our list that we already have. Um, so the project um, currently is to going to be ending around May. So we have between May and today <laughs> to, to get your materials in. But for um, get your materials in early, that will um, help us be better able to receive and review the materials in a, in a more timely manner. Thank you. And um, also, I know there were a few technical difficulties, but um, as far as Josh's uh, video, as well as um, other videos, you will be able to see them on our YouTube and our Facebook. Um, I appreciate everybody for sticking in there. We will be sending those out as soon as possible. Thank you for everybody being on. And um, Erica, did you want to close us out? 
Uh, we have oh. another question in the chat. It looks like um, aside from the emotional journey, what has been the most challenging part of developing this project? And are there plans for doing something with the content? Well, I can answer the last part and then I'll have the other folk answer the first one. So yeah, so the the first goal of the project is making the videos, um, the, the materials themselves available to the public. And then the aim is to, after that is to write another grant or get other funding if you're out there to do private funding where it's accept money from, from that area too, to do a documentary, um, to really get this information into schools and other educational spaces um, that this information, you know, might not be, not in textbooks yet, right? So I want to get the information out to the schools and have exhibits um, as well. So that is kind of the, the two different aims to get this material to the public. <clears throat> Anyone else want to touch on the, any of the challenges? Because for me, it's mostly just been emotional <laughs> challenges. I'll, I'll, I'll say the same exact thing, um, Erica. The emotional part was hard. I mean, I haven't talked about this for years, and I it, this is something that made me leave Charleston. I left Charleston completely because of this experience that I had. So the emotional part is probably the biggest thing. And then having to talk about it, something that I've been trying to get a therapist to talk about for you know, for years. Um, being able to talk about it with somebody who's been through something similar was very therapeutic, I guess I can say. Um, somebody that, but I, I, I don't think if it wasn't somebody that I actually knew who been through this, would I have been able to talk about it with them. Having Millicent on as the um, as the uh, moderator, that made it a lot better for us to be able to sit down uh, because we all of us know what Dr. Brown has went through. So us being able to sit down with her to say, all right, let me tell you the real, because you I, you already know what happened in the 60s and the same thing is happening over and over and over again. And that, that helped as opposed to just talking to somebody who had no idea what we went through. So yeah, very emotional. The emotional part was the hardest thing to get through. Like I said before, I ain't want to talk about it when you brought it up to me before we even thought about applying for the Donald Lee grant. So <laughs> that, yeah, we're here. I, actually, I remember when Josh brought it up to us, talking about we need to do an a, a oral history of 2015. I was like, I don't want to talk about that. I have no, I, I don't want to talk about that at all. At all. I haven't talked about it to anybody. So, <laughs> yeah going to jump in for just a second um, to try to respond to that question. Um, first of all, I think that it's a little early. Um, we have many more interviews and more material to collect for this project, which is wonderful. But I do think that a challenge that has come up for the team and the community group, the advisory group, is that we have to appreciate that history can't be taken in a vacuum. And our historical experiences, whether it's with organizing, picketing, um, um, raising money, whatever the participation is, there is emotional attachment to that. And so, I think that a challenge has been, as several of you have said, is, you know, I, I don't want to get into my personal feelings about what I did. And I've been trying to make sure that we understand that to stay healthy as people fighting for justice, that we cannot separate the two and that our emotional responses 
are a part of the history and that we need to embrace that, share as best we can uh, in this format or any other. But it's sort of pushing us to appreciate that people don't just struggle for systemic change and as if it's something that's not personal. It really is. And um, I think that this project is just kind of helping us to appreciate that, that we're not um, um, just trying to pat ourselves on the back, on our back. We're not trying to get glory. We are trying to really understand how difficult it is to challenge systemic racism and all the other oppressive forces that exist in society. And it's hard work. And I'm, again, very proud to be a part of working with people, young people, and people of all ages who are still determined to work in that vein. Yeah, um, I guess my difficulties were from a different angle because uh, first and foremost, I am an organizer, I am an activist um, before, um, before I'm a student, before I'm a um, photographer, before I'm a filmmaker, you know, that, that's what piqued my interest in this project um, in the beginning is because I'm an organizer and I'm interested in the lives of organizers and, and what organizers went through, you know, in Charleston in 2015 and during that era when I wasn't living here, you know, but I was very empathetic because I've been through similar things, you know, in Jacksonville and DC, um, you know, dealing with uh, police surveillance of, organ of organizations that I've been in, um, um, you know, um, and other things like that. So I was very empathetic to the stories that, were, that I was hearing, but it was just so, to me, it was just special to kind of just be an observer and just to listen to this history um, being told from so many different angles and get this kaleidoscope of, of an understanding of what was going on during the time um, you know, not even not just what was going on, but just how people felt. What were they like? Dr. Brown says you can't really disconnect, you know, your personal feelings um, and, and from this type of work. So <clears throat> for me, uh, the difficulty was uh, <laughs> more technical um, than emotional. Um, we're dealing with a lot, an extremely large amount of data um, with these with these video interviews and the audio. Um, so, you know, just figuring out the best way to integrate and, and to share this this massive amount of data with people. Um, as you can see, we had a technical difficulty tonight. tonight um, the video, for some reason, would not show on Zoom. Uh, so just dealing with the technical aspect of things, uh, outfitting the Avery, basically turning into a, a studio um, downstairs uh, at the Avery. Um, so, you know, my difficulty was more so on the technical end than, than on the emotional side of things. But I, but I do uh, deeply empathize with the people because I've, you know, I've been through similar things in my, in my experience as an organizer. Yeah, um, I understand. The video not showing was the feds not letting it show. So <laughs> it was... Um, I, I guess the next thing I want to say would be um, it was definitely emotional to where we are all stuck about what we can actually talk about. We're stuck. And I and I, I guess getting back to getting folk to actually talk about what their experiences was, all of us have a different experience being at the same place at the same time. I can have my same, I, I can have my interpretation of the experience or whatnot, but yet Brandon Fish, my, my great brother, who was there with me step on step on the way and have a totally different experience and a totally different viewpoint of what he saw, or be it Jason, or be it Shana Lee, or be it, you know, Moya Dean, or be it Erica, or somebody else, or Kua, or Donald, or somebody else at that same exact time. We're all seeing the same thing, but are experiencing something different at the same, at a very different time. That's, 
why these interviews are very um, important because we are getting different perspectives on the same exact thing at a very different time. So if you were there, I don't care what you were there for. I don't care what um, what role you played while you were there. Use that community portal to give your um, give your perspective because that's it's very important, very 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 important. Uh, and like I said, just taking it back to Brandon. Brian and I have been at the same place at the same exact time, and we've looked at two totally separate things. So please um, give your perspective, hop into that community portal and jump into it and give your perspective. Thank you, Darren. Dr. Bowley, you want to close us out? We've got two minutes left before seven. Sure. I want to thank everybody for coming out. I appreciate um, this team of researchers and community members. Uh, I also appreciate that it's intergenerational and multifaceted. So we get to hear from all, all points. Um, I changed my background because this week, um, Ajamo Nays, my mother was a freedom fighter, has been on my mind big time. And I've been just trying to figure out what to do um, with that moment. And so there's an opening in her book, um, My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter, it's a small poem, it's called Inner City Chants um, or Inner and then City in parentheses chants. And it says, we are the stories we tell ourselves. And I think in this particular, um, what we've seen this evening and throughout this project is that we are the stories that we A, tell about ourselves, but also the stories that we tell um, what our own and our own agency. And so I really appreciate that kind of idea and thinking about how this project really holds that true and holds that up to the light. So I will encourage all of you to, if you're out there watching and you're and you participated at some level or have reflections on the moments around thinking about Black Lives Mattering um, in this city, um, in this location, then I would really encourage you to contribute to the community portal. I'll also ask that you continue to check in with us. And as Aisha said, we are also open to donations as well to really keep this project going. So beyond this, we will go for grants, but our team is small and mighty. And so sometimes <laughs> a, little, a little investing that didn't require um, hovering over grants, because that's one thing I did want to say is that this team was dynamic in coming, to, coming with me to the project, but also dynamic in the sense that I appreciate the leadership here at the College of Charleston, specifically Dean White um, and our fellow uh, college leaders for kind of giving us um, permission um, and not forcing upon us the idea that we must go at it with a partnership. And then also the team of dynamic scholars um, and co-conspirators in the library systems who even though their names are not on the grant still contribute and support our work and so we're just very excited that this little three-story building down on 125 Bull Street gets the opportunity to play such, um, play such a role in documenting and being a space where we continue to tell our stories. So we thank you so much for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you again later in the year um, or on the portal. Until then, stay safe, stay hydrated, keep your mask on, take care. Thank you all.